Kia ora, it's Carl Burrows here um, from Hacker Works. Uh, this is Hacker in the Matrix. And why is it Hacker in the Matrix? Well, Hacker is something that we love doing, um, is what we do, but also in this particular case, we're talking about um, it's representing our Māori knowledge that has been passed down to us. Uh, in Matrix, um, as you're aware, um, in the movie, Neo, as he navigates his way through these different worlds, he discovers his li own life purpose. Um, and I think as we go um, through these worlds ourselves, discovering our own purpose um, as individuals and communities, as Māori, we have something very uh, precious that helps us to be able to do that. Um, and that's our culture that has been passed down to us um, from our ancestors. Um, and talking about uh, what's precious, um, we've got Precious Clark with, with us here today. Um, so um, we're going to catch up with her in a minute. Just before we do, um, I'm just going to do a quick uh, mihi mihi and a karakia, as we um, always do every um, week on this podcast. And the, and the mihi mihi is to acknowledge everybody, acknowledge uh, the kaupapa, the purpose, and to acknowledge um, our ancestors and what they've left for us. Also, we'll do a karakia tata wakapapa, which just gets us in the frame of mind to um, get on this path, that, on this journey that we're going on today. Uh, we're going to be speaking a little bit of Māori, um, and it should be obvious in the context what we're saying. Um, if not, it's probably too complex to be able to explain in English in a really short way. Um, but if you have any questions about what we're saying in te reo, or any questions at all for Precious, then just drop them in the um, in the chat, on, and we'll see it come through as, as we call it all. But um, we'd love to hear from you. So if anybody's watching um, and you want to say hi or kia ora, uh, just drop us a, a, a message. So, tēnei mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, au wakarongo mai ki a hau, tēnei uri o Taranaki, a mihi kauana. Tēnei anō oki irungi te kaupapa te wā, me ki ngā taonga tokuhi o ngā mātou tupuna. Me te whakaaro anō ki a rātou ngā mate o te wā, ngā mate e takoto ki runga ngā marae. Te kāinga, takoto, haere, haere, haere atura. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou, a tēnā koutou, a kia ora mai tātou. So, uh, precious. Tēnā koe kao, tēnā o te rā ki a koutou katoa, a ngā whanaunga ki ngā pitoto o te ao, e whakarongo mai nei ki tēnei kōrero, a ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. A koe tēnei, kei mui a koutou, heru i tēnei o ngā te whātua, o te uru o hau, waikato ngā te he, i te taha o tōku māma, a ki te taha o tōku pāpa, he pā ki a hau no Aotearoa, no reira ngā mihi kau atu ki a koutou katoa. Me koe hoki e hoa, pai ki te kite tō kanohi, nō ku te Waimari e ki te nohotahi i roto i tēnei ao rorohiko, ki te whakawhiti-whiti kōrero e pāna ki tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira ki a tāua, ki a tātou katoa a rā ko tō tātou ahure a Māori. Nō reira e mihi ana. Kia ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koe Prish. Uh, no kua no hoki te Waimari, and just some mihis from our other people coming through. So, Renice again, tēnā koe, Renice from um, Paris, she says bonjour. Uh, and we've got <laughs> Morena. <laughs> what is what is he saying, Segway? I don't know. Segway. <laughs> <laughs> he can explain, I'm sure. Welcome, Marmo, my bro. And Renita, Auntie Girl, Mama Kilda, Girl. and um, Jerry, and Fai Jerry. Kia ora, Fai Jerry. Kia and Zia. Kia ora, and Zia is our chairperson um, from Ngāti Rana at the moment over here. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, Precious. Um, I know Precious from uh, London here. I'm lucky to have a few he years with her while she was over on her overseas um, jaunts. And, but just really got to know you and what some of your values and your beliefs and um, a little bit about your upbringing. And just also know um, you've been quite supportive in my journey um, in terms of um, where I've been, so it's just really lovely to have you on here today. But can you just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and just in terms of being Māori in Auckland and from Ngāti Whātua? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I am 
conceived during the occupation of Bastion Point, which was a landmark, a watershed moment here in New Zealand's history. Um, so I was born into protest and uh, my living superhero is my uncle Joe Hawke, who was the leader of that protest movement. So very much um, raised in a family of freedom fighters. I um, am from Orake in Auckland, which is um, the centre of the universe as far as I'm concerned. It's a beautiful piece of land, um, probably the most prime real estate in New Zealand. It's where I currently live, so I live about a three minute walk away from my marae, which is my ancestral meeting home. But I was raised in Grey Lynn, which is quite a gentrified sub, um, suburb now. Uh, when I was being raised, it was um, a suburb that was heavily populated by Pacific people. So 90% of my school friends were from the Pacific Island nations. And so I learnt um, a lot of Pacific values from my neighbours and my friends and my teachers at that school. But I was very much entrenched in my Ngāti Whātua whānau. And every holidays I would spend in Orake with my cousins and every tangi, every hui at the marae, my mum would take us back there. So um, a very privileged upbringing, um, nurtured in particular by my uncles and my mum. My mum used to tell me that I didn't belong to her, I belonged to everybody from my tribe and that's something that um, I've held on to in terms of the service that I offer to my whanau and was um, very much nurtured by my uncle Joe um, as a leader for my family and as it turns out a leader for my hapu, my iwi. Kia ora, I'm back. Um, I think what your your experience though is not that usual for most people. Um, you know, we've had to leave where we come from. I'm talking about my parents' generation, I suppose. They had to leave where they came from and to go to Auckland or go to Wellington and to get jobs and to be part of the new world. So, um, yeah, it seems quite lucky for you to be able to experience being Maori um, in Auckland. But I also know. Um, you know, you're, you're still where you come from, but also I know that that comes with its difficulties as well. Yes, um, we do not classify ourselves as an urban iwi. We are an iwi that um, has maintained our ahika within an urban environment and the environment has built up around us. And so while we have um, we have access to things like great education and the potential of jobs, it hasn't necessarily realised itself. Um, but there are a lot of advantages of being in Auckland City. We are quite rare in that we have about 150 households that all live close to one another in Auckland City and we're all related. So my closest 100 neighbours are my cousins mm. and my nieces and nephews and my aunties, which is really quite rare in an urban environment. Mm. Um, but we've managed to hold on to that through, um, through great effort. Yeah. Um, the flip side of that is that, you know, the the flashing lights of the city were really beckoning to my mum's generation. And so um, the loss of real was imminent and, and was strongly felt. And our generation has really um, reclaimed that and taken action to reclaim that. So that our tamariki are first, uh, te reo Māori is the first language of many of our tamariki now. So we've managed to turn that tide, but it has been at some cost. Mm. So just um, going back to, you know, you talk about the values being brought up around your community with your aunties and uncles and um, having your cousins so close to you. Um, how is that, you know, and I know you from coming over overseas and <clears throat> into London and outside Aotearoa. I mean, how have those values served you in terms of moving out of home? Yeah, it took, um, took some courage to leave everything that you've known and leave um, a very safe environment where you're nurtured. So I would consider myself as being under the parido of my family, so kind of under the outstretched um, wing, so to speak. So it took great courage to come over here, but it was that confidence um, of knowing that you're loved, that you're supported, and that people want the best for you at home that allows you to take that leap of faith and um, travel overseas and live overseas. It also helped that I had a lot of friends that were already there who um, who wanted, uh, who wanted, acted as that parido, that extended wing for me as well. So that made it a whole lot easier. But definitely those, those home values that instill confidence, instill... Um, an essence of that your tupuna, your ancestors are always with you 
that coursing through your veins are blood memories, um, memories of your ancestors that allow you to step into the unknown and for, find a way, navigate a path. Um, so yeah, I think they have served well in my life and will continue to. Now I know uh, from your time here that you uh, were involved extensively in Ngāti Rānana and um, got wonderful memories of those times and also, also of course with Manaya as well and we've had some great trips around different places where we've been able to share our culture. Um, was that a surprise to you that people were so um, receptive to having Māori share their culture over the other side of the world and yeah and what were some of the experiences that stood out for you? It was a surprise um, compared to being in New Zealand where Māori culture at that time uh, was something that was we struggled to get it on a platform you know, Matatini, our national kapahaka competition, which is our version of the Olympics, has grown. But when I left New Zealand, it was still at its kind of um, teenage years, I'd say. Um, and so I remember a friend of mine, Kingi, um, Kingi Gilmer, he, Gilbert, sorry, he um, termed a phrase, Māori are globally hot, locally not. And I didn't quite understand it in the New Zealand context, but when I went overseas and understood how hungry people were to understand about our culture, it really did um, help me understand that adage, globally hot, locally not. And so coming to London and being a part of Ngāti Rānana and Manaya, which are two groups that helped grow me and helped shape me, um, was really eye-opening and um, I guess some of the real eye-opening things were, were that I got to meet people who were so hungry, Māori, who were so hungry for their culture and through no fault of their own um, had an experience of disengagement for, from it. Yeah. And you had the likes of yourself, myself, Puna, Shane, Titus, these people that had the privilege of growing up connected to their culture who were then able to share it with Fano, who had a right to learn their own culture um, so that was really eye-opening and that's um, it's put me in good stead for my business yeah. um, because it's helped me build a lot of empathy and aroha um, for people who who have an experience of disconnection but an extreme longing to access mm. you know their cultural heritage um, we had great times we had lots of great times yeah. um, and I went to London for mischief and Ngāti Rānana and Manaya certainly helped me experience that. <laughs> um, but I think I remember Bruce, um, Bruce Simpson, one of our, one of our whānau from London, um, when we were up in Scotland and doing a haka and pe him saying that people were quite terrified of me as a performer and then surprised that I could speak English. Um, <laughs> when we talked and surprised that I had, I was a lawyer. <laughs> so, you know, breaking down some of those barriers through our performing arts is, was really important. But also um, it being recognised on the even playing field with like the best ballet companies in the world. I remember when we went to Portugal for a Manaya gig, um, Carl, and we were yeah. performing alongside the ballet company and we were given the same treatment that they were. Um, because the standard of our performing arts is, is equivalent. So that was really eye-opening. And what it did for me is it really gave me a sense of what the worth of our culture is on a yeah. global scale, which yeah. at the time was not something that I had seen in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. I think um, things have changed at home, you know, but and when, certainly when I left, you know, there was... A disregard for our culture and it was wasn't seen as where it should be seen but I, my feeling has i mean i've been away from new zealand a long time but my feeling has that has changed um somewhat and over the years through the efforts of people at home um like yourself uh, i really find that interesting too that um over here maori can come from home not just maori but new zealanders can come yeah. from home and be part of ngati Rānana and somehow have the freedom to be able to um, rediscover the spark that exists within inside them. Somehow back at home, um, everything has been laid over the top of it and squashed, you know, that spark has been squashed and somehow here it's just um, opened and blossoms. And I think that's one of, one of the most wonderful things about um, Ngāti Rānana or club, as we say, 
um, that exists. Uh, I think, think that interestingly, and in, as a result of COVID-19, in the last two months, there has been more Māori content put online yeah. than, um, and made publicly accessible than there has been in the last 200 years. And, um, and so it's done really well to create access for people to culture. And we were really guarded before COVID-19 around sharing culture. So I used to talk about how if you wanted to access your culture as a Māori, you first of all had to know your whakapapa, know your marae, have the courage to go back there, find someone who's willing to teach you, find someone who is willing to teach you that has mātauranga, that has knowledge. Um, and actually, for the most part, those those various layers, as you call them, do not exist. Yeah. And so what people experience more often than not is if they go home, they experience judgment. Yeah, and rejection. And, they, and rejection, and they experience um, being put into their place, yeah. which is you need to come here and wash some dishes before you get access to your culture. And yeah. I guess I question, I question, is that the right approach? Yeah. And I think too that it's like a projection of everything that somebody, because of the huge amount of loss that has been suffered as a result of colonization. And then um, for the people back at home, um, when somebody turns up from the city or whatever, and um, there's this this sense of, I don't know, that loss gets projected on onto others sometimes. So what I'm saying is it's a huge risk for those young people to go back home um, and to face up to those challenges because of everything that people are dealing with at home as well around those issues. Yes, except now. Yeah. I think as a result of COVID-19, what you will see is that different groups, not just iwi or hapu, but also, you know, um, groups like Rungua Māori or Atua Māori, or um, they have become accessible so people can access knowledge and access their whānau from a distance and start to build rapport before they take the big um, courageous step of actually stepping onto a marae and saying, I am from you, can you help me? So there's more accessibility now to do that, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that's amazing. I think also, I mean, we've just started to do uh, some kapa haka online and it's just um, us teaching some simple words and actions to simple classic waiati, you know, and it's really well received. And it's not for you know experts at all. It's just for anybody who wants to know a little bit more about um, haka and, and to learn some kapa haka. And it's and it's been really fun and, and really enjoyable. So I think that's an example. And the reason why we're doing it is because we're sitting at home going, we're usually sharing our culture right now, you know, and, and if we can't do it because we're stuck at home. How can we do this? And this is why we've got these um, podcasts, but also um, we're doing it through ha um, kapa haka as well. And I've seen many other examples of that. So, okay. Um, I just really want to dig down a bit more into in terms of what do you think that people um, what are they getting when they see us perform or what is it about our culture that sparks something up within them that they fall in love with what they do i'm talking about um, overseas audiences or people who are non-maori what's going on there i just wonder what your thoughts are i think we have um, our performing arts culture is one that is um expresses ihi wihi and wana, which I guess is about full vitality and it resonates on a visceral level. So, um, you know, any kind of dancing, any kind of rhythmic movement, it helps people connect without using their mind first. You connect through heart and you connect through body. And our culture is one that allows that. So if you think of faro music from Portugal, you don't have to understand what they're singing about to feel an emotional connection. Yeah. And kapahaka is very similar. You can feel the ex you can feel ihi wihi wana, um at a visceral level without understanding the language. And what that does is it provides a really nice gateway into a deeper conversation about well, what is it to be Maori? What is the basis of your culture? What's important to you as Maori? What are these concepts of atua Maori? What is kaitiakitanga? What is manakitanga? Or why do you always feed us uh, when we come to your house? Why do you take your shoes off? Kapahaka allows you to have those conversations. And so I remember a lot from when we'd be traveling overseas and people would come to us um, after any performance and ask us more about who we were. And it's the 
rhythmic sway, it's the expression, it's the, the melodic singing that allows people to take that courageous step and come to us and then have a more meaningful conversation about what it is to be Māori. What were we singing about? What were we highlighting in the waiata that we were singing? So I think um, it's a visceral response yeah. first and foremost which exists in all cultural performances people have a visceral response to ballet they have a visceral response to opera ours is the form of kapahaka that mm. allows for a visceral response yeah i think that um what we do is we get from we get to a part of a person really quickly quite directly through haka um, but what i think what you, you touched on is that you know haka is kind of like an ex there's so much going on behind haka for us to get to that point and then um that's what people are interested on how how are you um expressing yourself with such commitment not just individually but as a as a group you know um mm -hmm. and yeah. which opens me up you know which connects with a deeper part of myself you know what's going on behind that and i think um there's a big conversation around that as well which if we mm -hmm. unpack it all um there is so much that we um so much about our leadership um, knowledge that in our cultural knowledge uh, that's in there um, and I suppose this is this is what I think is um, really valuable um, for the broader community that the world communities is that we've got all these things that have been given to us that you can experience in the moment through haka but actually there's so much more going on that people need to know about um, which you've touched on um, yeah, and um, I think that as I've gotten older, my understanding of the depth of it has has changed. So, you know, when I first started performing as a teenager, it was all about performance. Um, the older I get, it's more about um, holding on to legacies of ancestors and transmitting real, transmitting knowledge base, transmitting whakapapa. Um, trans transmitting genealogy and less so about the performance um, yeah. and and more so about um, the interconnectedness that you experience as a group member yeah. within a group. Um, you know, I remember when we were training for Manaya for the, we were singing with um, the opera, New Zealand opera singer, Lizzie Marvelli. Right. Um, for the rugby ball and we had pulled in a vocal coach and there were some times there where the resonance of our singing as a group was so on par that you couldn't distinguish the notes from each other they were just mm. a really well-rounded sound mm. and that to me is the modi of the group you know the life force of the group coming together that can't be replicated as a solo uh, venture so there's all of these things that, um, and that's what was really beautiful about um, Ngāti Rānana is the pro the focus there was on the um, whanaungatanga, was yeah. on being together more so than the performance, more so than a competition aspect, which um, drives a lot of kapahaka here in Aotearoa. It really was about creating Fano away from Aotearoa, mm -hmm. away from mm -hmm. home. Yeah, wonderful. I think, um, well, those are the values that come through haka, you know, kapa haka, which have a, appealed to everybody, you know, ourselves, of course, but also to others, because, I, and I want to come on to this in a minute, it's, it's a, those are some of the values that are really important um, for organisations, you know, for businesses, uh, which they find really difficult to replicate within an office environment or corporate environment. Uh, but before we do, I'm just going to say, there's a couple of messages from some people. We've got Nadia. Nadia says, uh, Morena. Oh, this is my Auntie Brenda in Australia. And Auntie Brenda. Um, Juanita says, Some of the best times ever must be talking about our trips away. <laughs> yep, uh, definitely. <laughs> and my um, sister in law, Michelle. Okay. Kia ora, Mish. Kia ora. All right. Um, and Shane, kia ora Shane, love this, thank you very much. Okay, so tell us about, you went back to Aotearoa um, and I've spoken to you a couple of times about the car and your business and really, um, really love for everybody else to hear how it's all going. Yeah, it's, um, I feel like I do the most privileged work in the world. So uh, I started my own business, which is called Modia. And from Modia, I, um, 
it was a consulting practice and I developed a Māori cultural competency training program called Te Ka, which is to ignite your Māori cultural competency. And what it does is it gives people access into Māori culture, mainly from a business sense, to help people engage with Māori in business. Um, I'm on a number of boards here, including my tribal commercial board and my tribal trust board. And um, what I've experienced through that is that many organizations don't know how to work with us they don't know how to talk to us they don't know how to talk with us when they're representing us either in advertising marketing or whatever they don't they don't really get who we are and so Taka is a response to that um, I was also being asked by different organizations to come and help them in my consultancy um, space and it would range from somebody's died in our shop and we don't know what to do through to we have a global leader coming and he's a change expert we need him to keep coming back to help one of New Zealand's biggest companies we think we need him to fall in love with New Zealand so Prish can you help us help him fall in love with New Zealand so as a consultant I was involved in a whole range of projects and um, what I identified is as a consultant you go in you help and you step out and then you go back in and help and the starting point for the conversation was always really low and i thought there has to be something more empowering than this to support organizations to increase their competency so that they can work in a maori space with a bit more confidence and so i designed this training program that i've been delivering since 2015 now um, and it's going really well and I've worked with a lot of different organisations. Um, our goal is to help 10,000 people positively identify with Māori culture. And so what I'm trying to do there is not just be something that they observe, but something that they take within their mind and their heart and in their puku, in their stomach, and mm. help to shift some behaviours. Because um, I have a very strong belief that our mātauranga Māori, our Māori world knowledge, um, can answer a lot of big, hairy, audacious problems that the globe experiences. Um, and so in order to help people understand the depth and the value of our culture, we need to take them on a transformational journey that starts with their own self-identity. Um, and that's what Te Ka essentially does. And a part of the reason why I do Te Ka is because, um, you know, I have green eyes, I have light hair and I have freckles and I leverage my white privilege every day. Um, and it served me well. And my daughter Tayaria, she doesn't look like me. She's chocolate brown and she's this gorgeous caramel coloured um, person with a Māori name. And so her trajectory in life is going to be quite different to mine. And race relations here in New Zealand, as Taika um, boldly put it, is New Zealand as racist as if. Um, and so I figure I've got about 18 years to make some moves to change things up so that my daughter, and not just my daughter, but all of my friends, all of my cousins' kids, leverage off their cultural capital, not be inhibited because of it. So there has to be some significant social change that occurs here for that to happen, and te kā for me is a part of that mechanism. Awesome. Kia ora. Um, there's a couple of things I want to just pull out from there. One, I think, is just watching your video last night and you and on your website and just hearing some of the... Uh, some of your clients talk, you know, they've, they've clearly been moved. So in terms of you achieving, connecting with them at those deeper levels, you know, in their stomachs, as you said, um, uh, something deeper, um, it's really something that's happening. And I mean, how are people, I want to I understand how are people um, receiving it. And also, well, just that last point, I remember you talking to me about this white privilege thing a, um, a while back. And was you know was something new for me and you know me being white as well um i hadn't it was the first time i really reflected on it and but now when you know when i go out into work and i work in a corporate environment um they listen to me um i dress in a certain way which may, means i'm accessible to them um they do, they do not fear me that they they're not putting barriers up um, so my messages are a lot more simple um, for them. I mean, it's easier for them. There's less in the way for them to accept what I'm saying. Um, and I know that's really difficult when I dress up, when we all dress up in, in kākahu, for example, and straight away they're projecting, oh, this is a performance group. 
Um, they are wearing costume. Um, they're from some tribe in New Zealand somewhere or something like that, you know, in the Pacific. Um, so straight away they're, they're putting up barriers and it's really difficult to communicate the same ideas, you know, in that sense. So I, I certainly understand that. I also think um, just understanding your dreams for your, your daughter because, you know, these, I think what drives me a lot is just the values that we were given as Māori um, was pushed down or, or put down and not given, um, you know, the kudos, I suppose, that they deserve. Um, but also for us, knowing deep inside, they were part of our very structure. So by putting them down, you're putting us down. And, you know, I don't want that for myself. I don't want that for my children. I don't want that for any of our children. So it's, it's certainly something I can relate to in terms of what drives me is that um, I want myself to be free on the world, you know, and I think that same thing for our children. Um, so just coming back to, you know, what I was saying before, how is it, how are people responding to what you're teaching them? Um, so the, the kumara doesn't speak of its own sweetness, so it's a bit of a hard question to answer. So maybe I'll answer it by sharing some of their feedback um, and, and how how they have used the transformation. So um, so I think uh, one of one of my she's she's now a close friend actually, and I it's a woman called Rebecca Ogilvy who is one of the executive leaders at um, Southern Cross Health Society. So she came on to Ka um, mainly to broaden her knowledge of Te Ao Māori to see how Southern Cross Health Society could have a bigger impact uh, for New Zealanders um, in the health space. She has three Māori sons. Her husband is Māori from Ngāti Pāua. Um, and she, you know, she wanted to take leadership and go on this journey. What's eventuated from that is that I've worked quite closely with Southern Cross Health Society, and we've since developed a, a Māori strategy. We've since developed a Māori advisory board, which will help that organisation to take leadership to create systems change in the health system, uh, which is begging for some shifts. And um, that board which Rebecca and I curated, um, of some magnificent people, including Che Wilson, who many from our Ngāti Rānana whānau will know and have fond memories of. Um, you know, we're really diving into what would a system shift look like and what could we move to? And we know that the answers exist within our Mātauranga Māori. And so we're um, suggesting and offering a atua matua model uh, for health, which talks about actually identity is what drives good health outcomes um, and this is not this is not exclusive for Māori this is any kind of group so what we observe is if you went into a Māori community and if you talked about um, you should undertake this activity so that you don't have this disease you're not going to get um, positive outcomes but if you say would you like to link into your whakapapa and through that we're going to go walk in in a forest and you're going to learn about the different trees and how they connect to tane mahuta and then what your own whakapapa is to that they're fully engaged and so we're looking at different models to flip the switch so it's having a profound impact because what people do is they um, come on to car and then they take us into the organization and we can start to unfold some different perspectives and different ways of looking at things for all New Zealand that may have a global reach as well um, yeah and so uh, most of my clients come through word of mouth. <laughs> I'm a pretty rubbish marketer. <laughs> and, um, I like to do the mahi more than um, than sell the product. So most, yeah, I'd say 90% of our um, clients come through word of mouth, which um, goes a long way to tell you the impact that it's having on the people who come on the journey. Um, interestingly, I traditionally... Uh, assumed that this would be something that would be of benefit for more non-Māori than for Māori. But in my last intake, it's the first time I've ever had um, the counter where I've had more Māori come on my program than non-Māori. And so the potential to um, expand Tika, especially through digital means, which we have now got as a result of COVID-19, uh, yeah, to create yeah. access for more of our whānau who live abroad is, um, is a reality, and we're quite excited by that. Um, 
what we know is that it gives people confidence. <clears throat> I think about one of my first intakes and I had this beautiful woman, another Rebecca from a different company, come on and he Māori no ngaitahu. Um, and her sister had always taken the lead for te ao Māori things within her family. And, um, and she was kind of on a, a commercial leadership trajectory. She came on to car to help her organization figure out how they might pivot. Um, and our last session um, has us going to the marae where we put everything we've learned into practice and she couldn't make it because her uncle had passed. And I had taught her karanga, he tangata Māori, so i whakāko au i te karanga ki aia. Um, I had taught her karanga to take our ope, take our group onto the marae. So she wasn't able to apply that in our session, but she applied it at the tangi. Wow. And she was able to leave, lead all of her whānau through every step because she had been imbued with all of this knowledge and she had confidence to do that. Mm. And she said that her father cried. He said, where did you learn this? And how did you learn this? And she said, oh, I've been on this program called the car. And, um, and that was extremely fulfilling for me to know mm. that somebody could lead their whānau through a Māori process um, and for their family to recognise that. So she didn't need to come to our graduation cer ceremony. She had her own graduation process. So I was really, really proud and really, um, uh, you know, it gives you that kind of ahi to continue to do the mahi that you do. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think uh, I spoke to Andrew Baker because we did some work in New Zealand. <laughs> so just so most people know, most of our work is based in the US and the UK in Europe and um, now and then we get asked to do work in Australia and New Zealand and and I remember talking to Andrew Baker about how how should I make it any different for um, this organization in New Zealand and um, there's quite a few Maori in the audience and he says um, you know don't change it at all it's the, still the same issues that humans have to deal with as as, as Maori as New Zealanders as people of the world you know there's, there's still the same um, thing so um, the other issue I think I want to talk about is uh, I just thought that was a really amazing example that you gave uh, of the value from our culture in terms of um, allowing people to connect to the to their whakapapa, to the environment you know and um, it's it just changes people's perspective on the world and, and changes how they because of that you know how we see ourselves connected um, we treat the world in a different way and I think more and more people need to know about that especially in relation to the environment and climate change and things like that yes but um I mean are there any other examples that stand out for you that um that you think hey this is Maori knowledge but it has equal applicability um to other people notwithstanding where they come from yeah yeah a couple of things jumped to mind so if you think of in business practice Māori um, Māori strategic planning is not wedded to election cycles or even your standard five-year cycles that exist for CEs um, our uh, projection and our strategies are intergenerational and so they're really long term with um, recognizing short-term steps that need to be taken within that and a lot of businesses can benefit from having that um, that long um, yeah. vision for their business. Um, another thing is um, is around servant leadership. So servant leadership is mm. part and parcel with being a leader within Māori society and definitely within any Pacific society as well and possibly most indigenous cultures too. Um, you know, it's that kanohi kitia. You have to be seen to be recognised as a leader. You have to be willing to do the work. And I think um, my cousin Monique Pihema coined it a tea towel tanga. So you've got to get in and pick up the tea towel and do the dishes and be present with your people before you can assume any kind of leadership role. And it really teaches you the value of being in service and of yeah. service to your people. You cannot assume that you are on top of your whānau because as soon as you do that, they will bring you back to reality. Um, and I think that that leadership, what it does is it shows that you're willing to step in this direction and people will be more willing to come with you rather than kind of be in a high tower. Um, I think COVID-19 has shown us um, 
has given us space to think deeply about things. So I'm involved in conversations around, well, the capitalist um, methodology has not been serving us well because in the space of two weeks, you see fish stocks being regenerated as a result of lack of um, commercial activity. Yeah. And um, can when we come out of COVID, can we still allow the environment to be the cost of commerce? And so, you know, I'm facilitating conversations around that. And, and some of the things that I'm um, thinking about is what is a new economic model? So if you think of economics as just being an assessment of how cultures and peoples um, transact, then um, why can't we be thinking about it from a Māori perspective? So if you think of economics in the 1700s, what um, what those early economists valued was agriculture. And so that was the basis of what was valued. 1800s um, through the Industrial Revolution, it became labor. 1900s, it became um, the right to choose. So, so self-selection, self-choice. And so we're ripe to shift that again. And I think of the Mo of, I think of Modi as a model that we could shift to. So Modi being that life force that exists within all living things, and Modi being the glue that connects those things together and connects you as a whole person. Mm. And so the value of Modi is interconnectedness. So if you think of the shift in the next economic, um, uh, I guess theory. Why couldn't interconnectedness be the thing that is valued by society and valued globally? And what might that do to change how we structure our companies in, New Ze in a New Zealand context? What would you change about the Companies Act to have a model that is underpinned by Modi? So I'm kind of thinking there, thinking about how does our culture and these things that have been practiced for thousands of years and still hold true and still hold relevant and still hold value, how can they be morphed into this modern society and give us um, ways of resolving issues like climate change, issues like poverty, issues like inequity? So I think there's heaps. We're just kind of scratching yeah. the surface. Yeah. No, we are. Um, well, that's what you made me realise. There's so much in there and I'm inspired. Uh, it just how do you think then, like even the first example you gave, uh, you know, about... Intergenerational. Fetal tanga. <laughs> mm. And yeah, and we, we have this vision. I have the vision of it in our mind of my in my mind of somebody sitting in a, in top of an organisation, the top of the tower, um, you know, separate from everybody else. I mean, it might not be a, a, a real image, but it's something that we do have. How do you get them from there into into this servant leadership mindset? I mean, what what is it? How can you sell that message? I suppose. What is it that helps change people's behaviour, um, and it's and it's behaviour that's cultural for them. And then you're saying, hey, how about, here's an alternative. How do you get people to, to move from A to B? You transform them. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, if my observation, and it's um, kind of rudimentary, is that um, if your identity and your culture is one that is not grounded in a connection with other people, then it's easy to assume autonomy and authority. When actually influence is your greater power, and influence comes from being connected. So um, so CEs that want to lead, the more connected they are to their people, the more they understand what's going on at the ground level for their organizations, the more their people are willing to follow them. So um, I guess you can, you can show them things like undercover boss as an example of um, how being connected at all levels of your organization helps you to get a better strategy, a better product, better processes and better systems. Um, so that's one mechanism. Yeah. And better um, outcomes for their business too, ultimately. Yeah. 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 So you, you can you can show the benefits to the to the bottom line, but what you want to shift is that the bottom line the monetary but financial bottom line is not the only measure yeah. and not the only indicator that people are really important yeah. um it's been really interested and in, interesting in COVID-19 to see the responses of different organizations um and you know a lot of a lot of jobs have been lost here in Aotearoa and some of them inevitable and, and unavoidable um, but there's been some pretty dodgy practices here as well um, but there have been some really stellar 
practices in business as well. So those organisations and leaders that are connected to their people are fighting tooth and nail to find a way to keep their people. Um, and we all know that your product does cannot, um, you cannot fulfil your goals if you don't have people to fulfil them. Um, and so one of the things that we did in our own, in my own business is, you know, got with our team and we had to pivot pretty quick. We lost our clients and, um, and we had to find ways to turn an uh, in-person product into something that was digital and find other ways to bring income in um, mm. while people got used to this new space that we were heading in towards. Um, and alongside that, alongside that, I'm constantly doing the numbers, like what are our numbers look like? How long have we got? What does our piece of string look like? And when those two bits of information came together, our strategy refresh and the numbers, I realized that we were going to turn a profit and actually in a COVID-19 environment where most of my staff are parents and two of them are solo parents, asking for full productivity to gain profit was not appropriate. And yeah. actually saying, let's pull back on the strategy and, um, and let's just break even over the next six months. That's enough. Yeah. And the thing that drove that is the value of whanaungatanga mm -hmm. and the value of manaakitanga. So whanaungatanga recognising that the relationship that I have with my staff is more important than putting a few more dollars into um, into the coffers. And the manaakitanga, the um, looking after and caring for one another's mana and our esteem and our prestige and our um, autonomy is really important in that equation as well. So it gave flexibility if I was, you know, being let values led, it gave flexibility to say, actually, profit's not the driver here, yeah. something else is. Yeah. So, you know, these are things that um, that come from our culture. Um, I had a good chat to James Kerr the other day, um, and he wrote the book Legacy, which touches on Maori values. But um, one of the conversation points was, uh, you know, these ideas are, are I mean, they're, they're old ideas, they're tribal ideas, they're people who are used to living together and having to rely on each other um, to, to survive and to get ahead. Um, and, you know, society is characterized by individualism, you know, especially capitalism, we look at individualism and competition. Um, but I think, I think the world's changing. I think there's, there's, you know, people are already having this conversation. And I know through our work, just by coming in with Haka and then, um, unpacking what's going on behind that you know how we um how we work together how we're connected together um and how we're expressing uh, uh our sharing our energy but that's focused on a particular co or purpose you know th those things are really valuable for um, organizations um so they're old ideas and just to see them being brought forward at this particular time is and having the right people like yourself to do that i think is really important too yeah um uh, i just had a train of thought, but I've lost it. Uh, oh, sorry. It's also the value of whanaungatanga. So we have a practice of whanaungatanga. And I can remember when I was in London and um, and I got you guys, I got Manaya to come in to my workplace um, to do to deliver haka. And what we had was a workplace um, that what represented the United Nations. So in my team, I had people from Nigeria, Egypt, Australia, um, England, Māori, and we used haka as a mechanism to create an even playing field for everyone. And in um, in my directorate, so my overall branch, there were there were people that were from neighbouring villages in Nigeria, but they'd never had a conversation about it until we did a Fanonga Tanga Mahi Mahi exercise, and they realised that they were miles away from each other in a yeah. massive landmass. And so we can bring, you know, those skills to the fore as well. And I know that just last week I had a um, a Zui session with one of my clients, and. Many of them I'd never met before. We were going through their sustainability strategy. And um, and rather than talk straight about business, I insisted that we at least get to know each other. And this team, one of the ladies, um, one of the ladies mentioned that it was the most she'd gotten to know her team in the last 12 months. And wow. it took 12 minutes. Yeah. So, you know, what we do is we lead out with our, the things that are important to us and it yeah. creates great team building. Yeah. Um, recently in San Francisco, we um, had about, there were eight of us Māori um, and we got together and we're doing a filming for a client and, you know, we turned up and they sort of said, okay, come into this room and they started telling us what was going to happen, you know, and I, 
half of our team hadn't met each other either because we were um you know somewhere else in alaska somewhere in las vegas somewhere in la and three come from london i said no we need to do what we need to do you know and, and it's and we just took the opportunity to say let's control it in our own way um and introduce ourselves in our own way and then after we've done that you know they all did the same thing you know this is in terms of the client and so with the film producers and the, and the you know, directors there and camera people and everybody was there introducing themselves. And, and it just bound us together for that whole day and, and made it something really special and something they'll never forget, you know, and they still write to us and, and just thank us for that. Um, and don't like, we just take that for granted, Carl? Yeah, yeah. When actually there's so much value in something as simple as mahi mahi, yeah. so much value. And and so if we extrapolate other parts of our culture, what ex what value can we extract from those as well that we can share globally to help people really connect? Kia ora. Hey, so just a quick um, look at who's saying hi is I think we said Mahirangi, didn't we? Kia ora Mahirangi. And oh, then, hey um, sis. <laughs> Petra in, Cha in Czech Republic. Oh yes, Petra. Kia ora Petra. Um, Marina, here we go, is Marina. Marina, um, Kia ora, I love Manai and hope to see you all soon. Stay healthy. Marina's with Fisher and Paykel in Germany. Oh, was that when we went to Dusseldorf? Um, this was 10 years later. Actually, she was there. She was there oh, as wow. well. And yeah. we, we just went recently, <laughs> two years ago, um, to do the same thing. It was a 10, because we went for a 10 year party, me and you, um, and the crew. And then recently it was the 20 year. Can you believe it? Well, yeah, oh, but yeah, it has been that long. Gosh. <laughs> um, and Fire Raywin, kia ora Fire. Uh, and Renice again, kia ora. And Roscoe Burns, just saying actuals. Um, <laughs> kia ora from France and Sam Morley. Um, and this is from May Lee. Okay. She's amazing. I've welled up twice. Fantastic explorations of cultural concepts and walking the talk. Kia ora, May Lee. Oh, kia ora, May Lee. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, so I think this has been, been a wonderful quarter, but I think um, what something that we're both really aware of is there's some limitations around what we do. And I especially think right now there's a lot of conversation out there about, yeah. you know, who's using our knowledge, why are they using our knowledge? Um, are they doing it the, in an appropriate way? Are they exploiting it? Um, are they, is it having a detrimental effect on our culture? Is it not? And I think it mainly, it mainly, mainly pops up in art or the performing arts, because um, I think that's the most obvious, um, you know. It's cropping about. up a lot more in, um, in commercial product at the moment over here. Yeah, okay. Um, and then, but again, what what is actually going on behind those ideas or the, the physical expression of those ideas through body movement or voice or um, through, you know, a physical reproduction um, there's also the values that, that are behind that, and which we're talking about, which we're trying to break down. So I'm just trying to understand, um, well, how do we approach this? Just, you know, if you can share some of the, the issues that are current in Aotearoa at the moment, that'll be a good way to sort of start the conversation. Yeah, I think uh, there's, there's a movement uh, growing in its um, strength, and it's not confined to New Zealand either. I, I see that it's an indigenous movement. And one moment. Can you turn your stuff off, please, babe? <laughs> um, it's called My Culture Is Not Your Paycheck. And I've seen a number of indigenous groups um, utilize that platform. And you see it a lot on Facebook. And so what they're doing is they're raising awareness about how organizations are using indigenous culture and deriving a commercial benefit from that. But more often than not, there are no indigenous people involved in the commercialization of that product. So it's a name and shame space. And I think it is appropriate because the time has come to get it right. Um, so, and, and, you know, the question that you asked was, how much do you share and how much do you hold? There are aspects of our culture that remain tapu, that remain sacred. And um, to really understand those things, you do have to, um, you do have to walk through the culture and have a lived experience of it to know what is tapu, what can remain, what is nor, what can be in the public domain, so to speak. But also there are a number of things that are already publicly available. So universities have been sharing 
our Mataranga for quite some time now. Um, and they probably caused a lot of stir in the early stages, but now they're par for course. And we have the likes of Te, Awanui, uh, te Wānango Awanui Arangi, Te Wānango Aotearoa, Te Wānango Oraukawa also sharing our Mataranga. So, um, so, you know, what we're doing isn't groundbreaking. Mm. It's just um, capturing it in a different um, package in a different way, in a diff different methodology to what you would get from a university. Um, and also our New Zealand curriculum through Kura Kaupapa has, transmits a lot of our mātauranga. Um, so, so there is a lot that is already out there, but I think being mindful about the depth of sharing and the purpose is really important. So I know with um, a number of my clients, they they will ask me questions around the appropriateness of using te reo Māori or Māori imagery, and I do challenge them. So, you know, just a theoretical example, if someone's designing a... Um, I don't know, a hoodie and it has a mokokowai on it, you know, my questions will be, what does your designer know about mokokowai? Mm. Um, what mm. does your designer know about that particular motif? What is it telling us? Is it tell Which part of New Zealand does that motif um, tell us co it comes from? And if they can't answer that, then I suggest to them, you probably shouldn't be using it. No. And um, and you need to have a strong narrative to be able to explain why your use of Māori imagery or te reo is, um, is appropriate and what are the actions that you as an organisation are taking to be a kaitiaki of te reo or be a kaitiaki of toi Māori, of Māori arts. Um, so if all you're doing is promoting it and socialising it but deriving the full economic benefit, then that's not a good ground to stand on. Actually, you have to do a bit more than that. Um, so I think it's really important to understand the why. Why yeah. are you using this? And yeah. to pull that apart and really ask some tough questions um, and challenge back to go, well, I don't think you've hit the mark here. And as a professional, I'm going to say, and as a kaitiaki of my deal, I'm going to say I don't agree with you using that, even though you might be paying me for my advice. Um, yeah. So those are some of the things that I do. And also... Um, I think about one of one another client who works in TV production, and we take I'm taking him on a journey, and he had some real misses in his engagement with Maori, and um, his intention was really good, but his intention was a non Maori intention, and it didn't resonate with Maori audiences, and I'm not giving him the words to help him resonate, I'm helping him do the work. Yeah. to resonate so you know i could i could draft him a script that would connect with marty but that's not the right approach the right approach is for him to understand what is his responsibility as a treaty partner and from that how does his business provide a platform for marty how does his um how does his white privilege allow marty culture to be leveraged in an environment that they might not be able to access so you know you've got it as as a kaitaki in the space of businesses and culture, you have to find the what, the mechanism to bridge those things together in an authentic way. And mm. it requires um, getting in under the covers, so to speak, and pulling some things apart and, again, getting back to identity. Oh yeah, well, thank you. I think I agree. There's, well, for, for me at least, the first examples you gave about people utilising or copying things, I mean, you see it on the internet. Um, and it's somewhere over in, in the US or I don't know where it is, but they just copy images and they promote yeah. it to Maori and it's just it's embarrassing. Um, but at the same time, you know, people buy them if they don't know, if they don't know the story behind yeah. it, they'll just go and buy it thinking it's legitimate. I mean, at the same time, some people argue, okay, um, if we look at the spectrum, um, that anybody should, should be able to use anybody's knowledge. You know, that's one end of the spectrum. Um, and then there's the other ex extreme, and I, I remember my grandmother saying she didn't like Pākehā speaking Māori. Um, it was something that only we should do. And um, so in between those two extremes is, um, you know, where we're trying to navigate um, and to uh, bring our cultures together. And, well, I suppose for me, I suppose being bi bicultural, having a dual heritage, um, it's really important that um, those things do come together somehow that um, there is common understanding across cultures and I think 
there's a lot of movement that needs to be done and is being done by Pākehā coming into a Māori space these days. Um, but, you know, there is a tension there um, about what we share and what we can't share. And I think in some ways our Māori knowledge is protected because you just can't use it, you know. Um, it's some, um, because when it gets to People a certain try. <laughs> but, Non-Māori yeah, maybe, will right? try. Um, yeah. I mean, at a certain depth, I mean, I'm talking about um, the deeper stuff that we need to retain as tapu, you know, it's like you just can't go and be a lawyer just because you say you're a lawyer or a doctor, you know, there's there's certain um, base understandings that you need to go through to get to a point where those things become really clear. We're, we're all on that journey. So, mm. so I think mm. to a certain extent those things are protected. Um, yeah, but I think uh, I just really like your focus on the narrative you know, which is exploring what people are trying to achieve and how they're going about it and are they, are they doing it the right way, challenging them to making sure that they've got the right intention behind them, if that's a good interpretation of what you were saying. Yeah, definitely. And I guess um, in a New Zealand context is raising awareness that the treaty um, doesn't just belong to Māori. The treaty is a document that belongs to all New Zealanders, um, even the most recent migrants. And so understanding the, that the treaty provides a bicultural foundation for multicultural application becomes really important. And so I really, through my mahi, encourage and invite people to consider what is their role in upholding the treaty as a person of the treaty, tangata tiriti. Mm. Um, and from that, that creates a shift in identity as well. And, um, and from that, people come to understand that actually they do have a role and a place and a space here in Aotearoa as yeah. non-Māori. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kia ora. Uh, okay, well, that, that conversation is going to continue forever, isn't it, as we sort of work, work our way through it? Um, I think just just from a, somebody who lives overseas and um, shares Māori culture overseas, I just find that, you know, sometimes clients will ask for just quite out there radical things. <laughs> and um, and then you just start, what's easier to do over here, we just say, no, we don't do that um, because of this. And they go, oh, okay. Then you say, well, what is it you're trying to achieve? You know, what is the end result you want? And they, they tell us. And then we go, well, there's, this is how we do it from our cultural perspective. Mm. We'll take them through yeah. the process. And they go, oh, that's even better. You know, that's great. That makes sense. Yes. And yeah. so it's quite, some, in some ways, it's a bit easier over here than at home where people have a little bit of knowledge and, you know, um, and rely on that knowledge as something that they might have got told from a school journal in 1973, you know, which is not that relevant. Yes, and it's surprising, um, you know, when I'm doing te kā, I take I take my participants through a number of exercises, and it's amazing with regards to Māori culture how much of their knowledge is from primary school, mm. and it has never it's not been developed or added to or um, explored since. Um, yeah, so your school journal example, it's on point, Carl. <laughs> yeah, and it's something and, and, that they hold on to, you know, and, and really believe in it. And then I think, how, how do you have the cheek to tell me who I am, you know, from some memory you have as a child reading a journal, you know? And also our culture has a right and a responsibility to evolve. Yeah. Because um, any culture is is the way you live and the way you experience your natural environment. And so, you know, some of the practices that we had 150 years ago are not suitable in mm. this modern day environment. And we are allowed to evolve yeah. those practices to suit um, who we are today. Yeah, good point. So the um, school journal thoughts of in 1984 don't necessarily serve us well today. <laughs> well, 73 for me. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just saying um, who we got, Donna. By Donna from the Kohanga Reo here in London. Always an inspiration, precious, beautiful kōrero, ngā mahi aroha, and clear Nisa oh, from club as well. Um, awesome kōrero. Oh, kia ora. Kōrero. Okay, um, we're pretty much near the end. Is there anything else you want to say about, you know, what you're doing, what's up for the future, and what, what some of your plans are moving forward? Ah, yeah. At the, at the moment, it's survival. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But we're getting ready to, to head back into providing um, what we do with Te Kā. We've got visions for 
um, kind of creating a push-pull factor. So we'd like to create an awards ceremony for Māori cultural competency in New Zealand. So they have real awards, but culture, you don't necessarily learn culture through real. Um, real is about a lang language acquisition and culture explores things um, that are found within the real. So yeah. wouldn't mind setting up that. Um, wouldn't mind providing te car globally so that more in particular for Māori so that their confidence of engaging within their culture is there and um, and when whānau come home they can participate in a home environment with confidence. Um, so those are some of the things that we're excited about and yeah we've gone digital so it's about um, expanding our, our, our reach really. Um, yeah. But I guess in, in last things is to e express uh, my gratitude for Ngāti Rānana and for Maraia, for Manaya, um, that what I learnt there has helped me considerably um, build um, a business and I'd like to acknowledge you Carl and your leadership of Manaya and the leadership of your whānau and how proud I am of you and to see what you're doing on a global scale it really makes me really proud and I fully support the way that you do what you do and there is a need for it um, because hakas is, is a gateway to access the depth of our culture mm. and you come with both of those skill sets um, and in a really loving way as well. So ngā mihi nui kia koe me tō rōpū, manaia, a rātou hoki o ngā tiranana e, um, e tāhuna tonu te ahi, ki reira ngā mihi nui kia koutou. Oh, kia ora. Hey, um, yeah, well, mā koe mihi kia koe mō uh, tō kōrero uh, i tēnei wā. Um, tō kōrero e, e whakamārama i nei taonga o uh, mātou tūpuna. I um, just want to say thank you for um, everything you've shared with us today and it's just it's been awesome to be in touch and um, it's, it's been a long time I know um, we, had, we had some wonderful times as, as you spoke about over here in London but um, uh, you know I spent a lot of time back at home and popping to see you and there was a difficult time for me when we lost Kateo that you were there for me and I, I always remember that. Um, and it's just really cool to hear what you're doing and taking this forward with so much, <clears throat> taking the complexity of the ideas um, to the, the nation um, because they're quite difficult to unpack and share in a way which is um, accessible for others so that they make sense because that's what we want. We want to be able to share things so people take them on board, start to live these values and we can start changing the world in a way which is a better place. So, Aye, koina. Um, and just some final mihis from people saying bye is, um, I think I said uh, bye Juanita. Um, Adam Harris is in Taranaki. I met Adam over here as part of the Vistage um, organization. And when we met, he had a picture of his maunga, my maunga on his computer screen. And um, he was telling me um, he's over in Taranaki and we've become friends. So it's good to hear him. Cool. Um, over there it's saying it's a bit wet. Um, we see fabulous interview, Carl Kyoda from Renice, Amanda Deer. Um, loving this poor hey, door. And there's your cousin again, Mish. Yeah, is that your relation? Mish <laughs> <laughs> Well, she's the mum of my nephew. <laughs> okay. Ka pai. Um, so, as is the customary, um, we often finish with a waiata, but I'm going to let you do that for us. Um, oh, okay. Here, yeah, so um, ma ma mawa. So, so kia ora ka huri ka ka mutu um ikone, ka huri Okay, uh, this is a song that encourages people to learn te reo, and it's a it's a short one. So um, okay, here we go. A ko hia mai nga tu mana ko ate iwi. A kohi a mai, toku reo rangatira reo maori. Ma hea hea e, a kohi a mai, kia pua waitia. A kohi a mai, he au manea nea. He au marama, a kohi a mai. Boo 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 boo. 
I just want to say, um, uh, we still have you on our video uh, for Manaya. We open up Manaya, and I, we get all our work because of you. So thank you. Um, <laughs> and then they say, "Where's that lady that's singing on the on the video?" Oh, she's still gone back home. But <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> probably hear that voice again. I'm um, so kia mai tiwi, kia mutu ikone, um, kia mahi kia koutou mo o taranga i te neiwa, kia ora mai tātou. Kia ora.